ask that you will guide us as we look at your word. Please help us to better understand how you related to culture to people when you were on this earth. Thank you, Lord.
a bunch of Jews. They would usually take the leading Jews, the nobles, things like that, or the young people, uh, and transport them to other parts of, in this case, the Assyrian Empire. And then they would bring people from other countries in. So it talks in 2 Kings 17, um, it talks about how they brought in people from all over, and they brought their gods with them. So their male and female gods, they bring with them. And the lions started attacking people in Samaria. Okay, and this wasn't a good thing, obviously. And so they said, well, why is this happening? Uh, well, the problem is, is that we don't know how to worship the God who is in control of this particular location. And so they brought in a priest, and he taught them how to worship God. Now, that's all fine and dandy, right? But the problem is, they didn't just worship God. What they did is, they just combined all the religions together. Um, so, the Samaritans uh, come from other, well, Gentile nations. So, Jewish and Gentile nations. They are not full Jewish people. So, the broadly speaking, in the time of Jesus... Jews would not go through Samaritan territory because it was unclean. So, Jesus obviously doesn't really care about that. And he sees a bigger picture. And so, he goes through Samaria and stops um, in Sychar where there is a well there. And so, it tells us in verse 6 that it's about, well, my Bible gives it, uh, it's the sixth hour, but it's around noon. And so it would be starting to get warm over there, um, and you're hot, you're tired, and you want to drink. I remember once when I was in Israel, a uh, friend and I, I don't know, we decided to walk from Tiberias around to uh, Capernaum, um, so on the lower part of the Sea of Galilee, up around the top. You know, it's a great idea when you start out. You just, you know, and I was carrying my guitar. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. It was a long walk. <laughs> we got kind of tired at then. And I remember being thirsty. <laughs> okay, really thirsty, too. So, uh, over there, it's just hot, dry, and, um, you know, and if it's in the summertime, we don't know exactly when this is. Uh, it, it, it's just so he wanted to drink. So he's tired. He wants a rest. And in verse 7, then, okay, just, I just wanted to, oh, oh, the one thing, sorry, I forgot to do the last two things. A question that's raised is why does it say it's the sixth hour? Is it to tell us, okay, this is why Jesus would be hot and tired? Or is it to tell us that the Samaritan woman was avoiding people? Okay, we'll talk more about that one in probably the next slide. Um, so there's a couple of options, maybe it's both. Now, one of the things that's interesting is this is one of the longest recorded conversations of Jesus. Like conversations they had. You have in John his um, conversation or talk he had with the disciples before he was crucified. Um, so. It's interesting that one of the longest recorded conversations with Jesus is with a woman, because that is really countercultural in that time. In verse 9, then, uh, we go to Jesus, and, well, first in verse 7, he says, hey, give me a drink. Which, okay, that's probably not a, a problem, because he wouldn't have anything to get the water to drink from. Um, his disciples aren't here, and the woman <laughs> asked him a question in verse 9. Um, why? You're a Jew. Why are you asking me for a drink? Because, again, uh, Samaria was unclean to the Jews, and so why would you want to drink from her? Because anything she touched would be And John tells us, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And so Jesus then has a conversation with her. He doesn't just say, well, I'm thirsty and I need a drink, right? So he has a conversation with her about water. And 
as we read it, verse 10, Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was, he says, do you give me a drink? You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Uh, living water during that time is water normally that flows. Okay, and that's living water. It's not stagnant. And she doesn't understand him. Verse 11. Uh, you don't have anything to get water from, okay? The well is deep. He, where do you get then this living water? And talks about her ancestor Jacob who gave him the well. But then Jesus says in verse 13, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them will never thirst. For the water I will give them will become in them a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now, he's, he's talking on a spiritual level, right? She's thinking on a physical level, he asked her for a drink. Okay, and then he launches into this conversation about spiritual water. So using every opportunity, right? I don't know if you saw something in this lady that is like she's seeking, she needs, you know, more than just this conversation about, yes, I'll give you a drink. Okay, thank you. Um, but it goes off into this conversation. And again, she doesn't get it because he asked for a drink. And so verse 15, she says, sir, give me this water so that I won't be thirsty. I mean, that'll be cool. You know, I'll just turn my tap on in my house and I'll be good to go. I won't ever have to come here and get water again. <laughs> and I can handle that. Um, not, not getting. So, and not really communicating, which isn't really surprising because we see this all the time with Jesus and his communication with people. And we could argue with us. You know, as God talks to us, uh, probably sometimes it's, we are just totally missing the point. Okay, we're not thinking on the same plane as he is. And so Jesus then goes in verse 16 and brings up, um, says, well, go get your husband and then come here. And the woman says, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, well, that's true. You don't have a husband. Yeah, you had five husbands, actually, and the man that you're living with now isn't your husband. This you have said truly. How does, how does he know all this information? Did she have it you know, tattooed or something? You know, husband, one, two, three, four, five, other husbands. <laughs> it's a lot of husbands. Uh, in in Jewish, uh, Jewish culture, uh, at least what they say, um, and now, we don't know what happened to her husband. Maybe she had bad luck. Okay, I mean, that could be. Remember, back in the Old Testament, Judah, one of the sons of Jacob, he had three boys. And first, uh, the first boy married Tamar. What happens? He dies. Okay, because he's not a good guy. That's what the Bible says. Then the second guy is to come in and do his duty have sex with Tamar so that the child that is produced would be raised up in the name of the dead son. Well, what happens to him? He doesn't follow through and he dies. So son number three is not old enough to be married yet. Okay. And so uh, Judah says, okay, I'll give him you, you know, you'll give him when he grows up and he's old enough to be married. But he remains on his promise. And then eventually, if you remember, Tamar sits alongside the road because her father-in-law reneged on his promise, pretends she's a prostitute, uh, he has sex with her, she gets pregnant, she has twins. Before she actually has the twins and they figure out that she's pregnant, Judah uh, is told that she's pregnant, and what does he say? Yeah, burn her! But... She is a smart woman, and she has uh, his staff and board and things that will identify him. So she says, oh, this is the father of the child. And, oops. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he calls her more righteous than he, and she actually has twins. And you know what's interesting? The twins, one of those twins is part of the line of the Messiah. So again, 
when we look at God and how he interacts with people, he never does it the way we think he should, right? Because if you have the Messiah, okay, God in the flesh coming, shouldn't it be from this like crystal clear line that's not polluted at all? You know, that's what we might think, but God does not see it that way, obviously, at all. Um, you have Bathsheba, who, uh, she's in the line of the Messiah. Rahab, it suggested Rahab, who's a prostitute in Jericho, is likewise in the line of the Messiah. So God just sees things really, really differently than we do. And so in connection with this woman who has five husbands, we don't know what happened to her husbands. The rabbis, it said, regarded like two at the most, three marriages, the maximum for a woman. You know, did she just have bad luck and her husband's died? Did she get divorced? We don't have any clue. What we do know is that the guy she currently is living with is not her husband. We don't know why. Um, was, was there some reason they couldn't be married? We don't really know what was going on, just that at least formally they're not married. And so this woman perceives that Jesus is a prophet. Because like, otherwise, how would you know this information? And so then she goes on and asks him uh, another question about worshiping God. And so where should you worship? Now, the Samaritans, they believe that the place that you should worship God was um, on Mount Gerizim. And so still today, Samaritans actually, they will sacrifice a Passover lamb at Mount Gerizim. They do the whole thing. Uh, it used to be you could go and watch them do a Samaritan Passover. Um, as they read the Old Testament, they only do the first five books of the Old Testament. And in their version of the Old Testament, Mount Gerizim is a place that God chooses for them to worship. So they believe that they have the correct place to worship, but the Jews are wrong because you don't get Jerusalem being the place God chose until you get into the historical books with Solomon. So, so what's going on? So she brings up uh, this question. We say here, you say Jerusalem, and again, Jesus doesn't get into the argument an hour is coming, he says in verse 21, when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you don't know, we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And then an hour is coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. And then the woman brings up in verse 25, I know the Messiah is coming. When that one comes, he'll declare all things to us. Now look at verse 26. What does Jesus say? Yeah. Now, how often does Jesus tell people flat out he's the Messiah? No, no, he rarely. In fact, he's constantly telling people, shh, don't tell anybody about this, right? Now, why does he do that? I mean, should people know he's actually the Messiah? Hello, this is who they've been waiting for. So why doesn't he tell them? Because they don't get it, what the Messiah is going to do. What is the Messiah? He's going to ride in on a white horse, right? And he's going to take up the Romans, and they're going to be gone, right? And then Israel will once again be free, and they will be able to rule and have their kings just like they're in the time of King David. So, he flat out tells this woman, hey, I'm that one. And she said, get out of here, you are not. <laughs> no, 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 you don't read that about here, do you? <laughs> um, you get the idea that as you keep going, now at this point in verse 27, his disciples come back and look, they're amazed he's speaking with a woman. Now, uh, we didn't really talk about the fact she has five husbands um, and she's getting water during noontime. 
Now, one of the suggestions is why is she getting water at noon? It's because normally you get your water in the morning or the evening just because it's not as hot. <laughs> Very practical reason. Um, so why is she getting that at noon? Uh, well, maybe, maybe because she's living with this guy, she's had five husbands, maybe she's kind of had a checkered past, she's not, you know, looked upon highly by her community, maybe that is what it is. So she goes at noon to avoid the women, uh, the other women who are getting water. She doesn't need the gossip, the looks, the comments, etc., etc. So maybe this is why she goes at noon. I mean, she could have just run out of water, um, that would, but again, it, that would be kind of unusual. So it suggested uh, with these few things that she probably isn't necessarily one of the upstanding citizens in her community, at least not seen that way from an external point of view. So the disciples asked, why is he speaking with a woman? And then verse 28, it tells us a woman left her water pot. What, did she forget for or something? Or, I always have to forget anything. No, I don't know. It seems to me she forgot her water pot because she was so excited to go tell the people in her city what she had just found out. Hello, the Messiah is here. Okay? This is so cool. How long have they been waiting for a Messiah? A long time, right? And finally he's here. And man, he's even in Samaria. So isn't this the coolest thing in the world? And so she goes and she talks to the men in the city. And verse 29, she says, come and see this guy. This isn't the Messiah, is it? He told me everything I did. Okay, he knows all sorts of things about me. He shouldn't know all these things, but he does. Okay, he's extra special. There's something about him. So she thinks, you know, oh, it's a pretty good idea. This guy's the Messiah. And so what happens then? They come out. The people of the city come out and have a conversation with Jesus. Now, remember, and, and Jesus doesn't balk and say, oh my, oh, there's too many, I gotta get out of here because they're all Samaritans and yo, oh, bad, bad, bad. No, 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 right? Again, he's just countercultural all over the place, Jesus is. So, first he talks to a woman and has a small conversation with her according to what we have for conversations with people. Um, and then the men of the city come out. So, Jesus is all about teaching people who he is, right? Giving them the truth. And in verse 40, they come and look. They're asking him to stay with them, and he stays there for two days. Two days he stays there. And what is he doing? He is teaching them.